Yeah, so chapter seven, I just uploaded slides a few minutes ago, maybe one hour ago. And chapter seven is moving beyond linearity. So we are doing something more than just, you know, y is equal to a plus bx. So the most basic model to relate variable x and y is a linear model, y is equal to beta naught plus beta one x, maybe plus epsilon, I would say. Yeah, so when we say linear model, usually that is linear with respect to beta naught and beta one, but the here that we only care about the relationship between X and Y. So this is uh, linear in two ways. So uh, this is a linear function. Y is a linear function of X. So in, if a more complicated relationship is to be investigated, then there are a number of ways to deal with nonlinear relationship between X and Y. And that is the topic in chapter seven. And you can imagine that, okay, so still it's a linear model in terms of you know, parameters beta naught to beta p, but the, if we use polynomial regression, we can relate y on x, x square up to x to the this power. Then at least the, we can model the rela relationship between x and y. Nonlinear relationship between x and y. So for example, if we have the, this kind of complicated pattern, maybe the cubic curve that fits well. So maybe the, when we say nonlinear relationship between X and Y, that we have maybe two stages. So one is just simply the curve is not linear, but still the monotone. For example, that if the relationship is like, like this, then, okay, so it's not, you know, straight line pattern, but the, if we fit maybe exponential curve, maybe quadratic curve, then it fits well. So as long as monotone, if we transform X or Y or both, then the, it can work better. So basically any monotone relationship uh, can become linear if we can do an arbitrary transformation of X and Y. So that is simpler case, but the, for this kind of, you know, the second case, the relationship is nonlinear and the, the not mono, monotonic. So in this case, we need something more Then polynomial regression may work. And the logistic regression also, the um, this method works. I think that we, we can see in the next slide, but the, um, also, we can see the logistic regression. I mean, the probability of y is equal to one is the logit function of the beta naught plus beta one x plus up to beta x p x to the power p, maybe d here. So it sounds this textbook uses d uh, when d has already been chosen uh, optimal the number of parameters. So this is also possible. Maybe it's a little bit. Yeah. So and this is one example. Um, usually, um, it's not really easy to find a good example. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Just a moment. Uh, okay, sorry, that I accidentally the turned off the, my computer. Just a moment. Yeah, usually it's hard to find um, polynomial regression examples from in you know, real world data. 
Um, yeah, once the one student investigates the relationship between age of baseball players and the number of home runs in the baseball players. And the baseball players, the, their peak is around age 30. So we expect we have some, you know, quadratic pattern the, between the age and the number of home runs. And it's even, we have such an intuition, still the regression does not work uh, in his example. So it's really the, uh, hard, but the, um, this also um, finds a, found a good example. And here is the age and wage. And the, you can see that this wage is the um, continuous scale wage. Maybe this is the $50,000 and this is $300,000. And the right-hand side is just the dichotomized version. So whether or not wage is more than $250,000. And the, in the left-hand side, um, okay, so the trend is not uh, very obvious, but the, you can see that, the, uh, for example, around here, the, we have basically the all people have low wage, low wage, and the here, maybe variance is slightly larger, but at least that we don't have the people who have very large income. And around age 40 or 50, we have a you know, good number of the larger um, number of people with larger income and also extremely the um, high income people. I don't know the why the, around here, we don't have any observations, but the, uh, at least it sounds that the, from age maybe 35 to 55, maybe 60, that we have uh, people with higher wage. And the 250, if we make 250 as threshold, then you can see the maybe larger percentage of people that get the um, higher than $250,000 income in age, maybe 35 to 60. And that is here. Actually, the only observations are represented here and here. You can see a little bit that it's, yeah. And the fitted line is these blue curves. And the dotted line is, I think that the confidence band for um, this the fitted the, uh, polynomial curve. So here, I don't know, this looks a little complicated, at least maybe the fourth degree polynomial or something. And here, I think even more complicated one. Um, yeah, fourth degree polynomial with logit function. So we can see the nonlinear relationship, just not monotonic. So that is what we have done uh, so far, um, you know, the, until the chapter seven, the to um, deal with nonlinearity. But the chapter seven deals with the more uh, patterns, more strategies. And this, we have, we discuss many uh, other, many different methods, but the, at first we discussed the step functions. This is a basic and also the base for other methods and the step function. So this is the uh, pretty simple idea that if we have X and Y, we just fit the step function. That is the piecewise constant function to fit the data. So that means if we have this kind of observations, Just that we split this into several pieces, maybe like this and this and maybe the, um, maybe this and maybe this. Then we fit the just um, step function to this. Then, okay, so this is not continuous function and it may not be the best function to fit, but at least it's very flexible if we have this not points, so th these are not knots or are not points. So this one or this one. This. So for each interval between uh, not points, then we fit um, step functions. We, we, we fit a piecewise constant function. So that is the step functions. 
and we here the in text in this textbook that we denote step functions as c not of x c one of x c two of x to ck of x so that this indicator functions for x less than c one so in this figure this is c one value this is c two c three c four so in this case k is equal to four so we have basically the five um you know um, levels so okay so this one um is a kind of uh, it, it's actually in the in a class of linear function because the y i is represented by beta naught plus beta one c one plus beta two c two plus up to beta k c k so to be specific um basically the beta naught is the level for the first function so this level is beta naught right and uh, this level is basically the beta one uh sorry um, beta naught plus beta one right uh, beta naught plus beta one and so on so this level is beta naught plus beta one plus beta two okay so in this way that we can formulate this as a linear regression still however the this method is problematic because it is difficult to determine not point c1 to ck so you can imagine how to estimate the beta naught beta one up to beta k right because the, this is just a linear regression you can just the uh, you know code these indicator functions then calculate matrix then we calculate x transpose x inverse x transpose y then we can automatically get beta we can automatically get beta naught to beta k hat right but the to choose the c1 to ck are much more difficult problem right so if the just we have the arbitrary the four time points that's fine but the certainly the depending on the pattern of the curve that we have some optimal thresholds right in the previous example of age and wage probably that we should have um threshold we have thresholds at maybe 35 and 60 or something like that and that is difficult to estimate it's not really the um you know the linear optimization problem so the it's highly nonlinear problem and uh, um it's pretty hard and i think we don't have any you know the um excellent method to do that so the, we discussed the remedies for this but the uh basically we don't really have the uh, very good method to choose c1 to ck and also hey how many not points are necessary so Actually, it's also another uh, difficult problem. Maybe it's slightly less difficult than choosing the not points because anyway, the, we don't need the too many points. Uh, you know, too many not points, but the, um, still, the, this is another issue. So, given k is equal to three or k is equal to five, then okay, so uh, we can. Uh, do some way to find the c1 to ck but the, we have to determine k and also we have to de yeah so basically we, we have to know which k is the best so this is an example uh, fit fitted on this the age versus wage data so with that function we have this pattern and the for logistic regression we have this actually the logistic regression it sounds uh, maybe one more level is maybe not point k is equal to two here probably at 30 maybe 33 and 64 or something here we have two not points probably like the 34 and the 63 or 4 and also maybe um 48 maybe this is the age that the many people working in big companies that become executives or something so we have the slight jump here yeah so it makes sense and it's data oriented method it's flexible but we have some disadvantages it's not continuous it's hard to choose k hard to choose c1 to ck So now that we want to do a little more uh, 
uh, practical way. And the, uh, this is a kind of generalization of polynomial regression. So the regression with basis functions. And the, generally, the, we can use basis functions beta 1x to beta, one, beta kx uh, in regression. So that is this model. So in polynomial regression, we have used just you know x and x square to x to the case power. But that isn't very good. For example, if we think about the interval x is between 0 and 1, for example, x to the fifth power and x to the sixth power, almost the same, right? So if we think about x is between 0 and 1, then x to the you know, case power is always 1 when x is equal to 1, 0 if x is equal to 0. x to the fifth power, maybe like this, right? And x to the sixth power, what's that? x to the sixth power, like this, okay? Almost the same, right? So it's not really good idea to use the x to x to the case power as basis. It really depends on the you know the region and it depends on the function, but the generally the x to the case power is too simple. And we have some remedies we can use orthogonal basis. Yeah, but the to find orthogonal basis is uh, uh, not very really convenient. Maybe the R can do automatically, but that is one thing. So with using more appropriate the x b1 to bk, then we can avoid the multicollinearity. And also sometimes we assume some things. For example, the I'm not sure that if I asked the you to analyze the beaver temperature data, but suppose that we have beaver temperature data for 30 days, and then we have seasonality, 24 hour seasonality. And if we do for the human temperature, maybe in addition to daily seasonality, we may have weekly seasonality. If the data is longer, then we have you know annual seasonalities and so on. So we can include specific features such as periodicity and also the boundedness, therefore, that is basis B1 to BK. For example, polynomial. Polynomial may be good. Um, for example, um, suppose that the we have the ideal situation like x is between negative one and a positive one, and x and x square and x cube are all different functions, and it fits well for the data. But the, if the you know if we extrapolate those curves, uh, that curve, then if x is equal to ten. Basically, x cubed becomes very large number. So even if the uh, coefficient sounds stable, still, if we plug in x is equal to 10, the result is unstable. So sometimes we want the boundness or some boundedness or something. So for this purpose, the basis functions are much more flexible to incorporate the features we want. So typically, you know, if we consider Fourier analysis, the cosine and the sines are good functions to include, especially if we include both cosine and the sine, that we can, you know, adjust phase as well as, you know, magnitude by quotient. So uh, that is pretty good. And as the example, yeah, polynomials and the um, cosine, sine curves, and um, except for that, maybe I don't have too many. Maybe the another one is some wave. The, just the, um, for example, x and y, and something like this. Okay, so that may be useful. So suppose this value is like k, and we consider the function fk and we fit you know f1 to fd or something like that so that may be useful it's bounded and the, it can identify the bump at some point mm, yeah and of course the step, fun step function is one 
example of the, these bases. So B1 to BK are all piecewise um, constant function. Yeah, and here K is the basically fixed. Um, yes, so we have to pretty time in K, that's true, but uh, still um, it's more useful than polynomial regression. Uh, do you have any questions so far? And the basis function can be fit by just linear model. So this is linear in terms of betas. So beta not beta one, beta two. This is just a linear model. So we can prepare a matrix X, the design matrix X. Then we can just do beta hat is equal to X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. So it can fit this. by just usual least square linear regression. Of course, how to choose B1 to BK is another issue, but once it's fixed, then um, fitting is by least square. Okay, so now um, We do a little more. So I think probably the B1 to BK, the one difficulty is how to define B1 to BK. So maybe cosine curve, sine curve, or these the single waves. Um, those are good examples. But the beyond that, probably it's hard to uh, imagine how to set up B1 to BK. So we think about more, you know, one size fit all uh, function, and that is the regression splines. So this is a generalization of step function. So a more general case of step functions. So basically that we consider the piecewise polynomial functions. So a step function is piecewise constant. Then next one is maybe piecewise linear function. Like the, the piecewise we have the straight line, but the straight line changes at not points. So that is the uh, maybe another one. And the straight line, maybe next one is the cubic line. Maybe we have the two uh, parabola, uh, not, not uh, sorry, not, not a parabola. So um, yeah, so two, two, you know, the quadratic functions that and maybe connected each other. So that is another one. And maybe the, the Next one is piecewise cubic function and piecewise quartic function and so on. And often we use the piecewise cubic function. So the it does not have to be cubic, but the, um, we have this kind of function. Then um, it is a little more um, flexible than step functions. And also at least we have some idea on um, what functions to use. So the, this is polynomial, piecewise polynomial. And in this case, we have eight parameters. So we have maybe twice as complicated as just simple, the cubic function. But the, um, So this uh, often works good. So it's a pretty artificial function, but the still the, it's good for interpolation. And usually the, we want the, this function uh, to be continuous. Um, so this function uh, has the not point C, but the, we don't require, if we don't require anything, then we have pretty, um, you know, the discontinuous function, maybe we see uh, later the example, but the, if just we fit cubic function in two sections of the data set here and here, sometimes these two cubic functions are not continuous at the not point C. So that isn't very really, um, good. So sometimes that we assume that, um, additional assumptions such as continuity. Yeah, so the two imports those assumptions that we basically they prepare a slightly more sophisticated version, the regression spline. So the regression spline is the more sophisticated method to import continuity as well as the same derivatives at not points so that the resulting fitted curve, fitted function is smooth enough. So 
if we have piecewise linear function like this, then um, just continuity is only thing we can expect. But the, suppose we have piecewise the quadratic function, then in, in addition to you know the continuity, also we make the first derivative the same. So just you know one quadratic function here and another quadratic function back right here, then if it's smooth at this point, if we have the same derivative, then the the fitted curve looks better, right? So the, we want to fit this kind of curve. So we um, assume the derivatives are also the same. Sometimes we assume the second derivative are the same or third derivatives are the same. So the, to be exact, the um, we define the cubic spline. So a function which is a piecewise cubic function, the third degree polynomial, and has k naughts, k is a fixed number, and is continuous and has the same first and second derivatives. So that is called the cubic spline. And the cubic spline is actually obtained by the, this function. So beta naught plus beta one B one plus beta two B two up to beta K plus three uh, B K plus three X I. If we carefully choose B one to B K plus three. Uh, Yes, so yes, and actually the k is the number of knots. And the beta one to be k are cubic functions. Maybe to be exact, actually the um maybe I should say that the b1, b2, b3 are different. And b4 to b k plus three are assigned for each additional knot points. So this is basically the base cubic function. And these are, you know, addition for knot points. To be exact, the additions. So we need one basis function, one additional basis function when the, we go through the one not point because the function will get different. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. So, yeah, so that is the way. And why the, we can write the cubic spline in, in this simple way. So this is just a linear regression, right? So linear regression is the um, k plus three, k plus four times. So um, why we can do that? So we can basically the, um, go back to the um, this very, you know, the simple, the piecewise, the cubic function. So suppose that the, we have piecewise cubic function and we impose the continuity we impose if continuity like this okay so this is the not point then how many parameters there should be included in this model originally we have eight parameters but the if we impose continuity so that is one restriction so actually um beta zero two so this should be adjusted so that the, this first piece, I would say the F1, X, and the second piece, F2, X, um, is continuous at point C. So beta 0, 2, actually we cannot really choose it. And we can only choose the remaining parameter, remaining seven parameters, one, two, three, four, uh, six, uh, five, six, seven. So, uh, literally, we have seven parameters only. So beta zero two, the, it's automatically adjusted for C. So if continue, if continuous, so this is fixed. This is automatically determined.
So that is the um, idea. So how about this case that we have the piecewise cubic function. So each piece have cubic functions, so four parameters. And okay, so after the not point C1, we have another cubic function. Sorry, that, that should be smooth, uh, smooth enough. So, so not point we have and the pattern changes, but the still it's smooth like this. And smooth like this. and smooth like this. So in this case, okay, so each part is cubic function. We have four additional parameters once that we um, go over uh, each not point, but the to assume continuity that we have to subtract one parameter and to assume the first derivative is the same, the, basically that we have to subtract another parameter and to assume the second derivative coincide for these two curves that we have to subtract one again. So basically we only have one degree of freedom for each additional section of this cubic curve. So that is the point for the cubic spline. And actually it's not really difficult if we uh, think about it for a little more. So Okay, so why is it always possible for the function above to satisfy the three conditions for the cubic splines? So at first that we need the um, cubic function for the most left section. So we have x and x squared, x cubed and intercept. So we have four parameters. Then after passing each node point, the C1, C2, C3 in general that we write that, that as C, then basically we just add, we, we just have to add this function X minus C cube plus that is X minus C cube if X is large, larger than C and the zero otherwise. So that is the function, cubic function, which slowly change values after C. So C is here then cubic function here. So this function has the value at zero. So the value of zero at C and also first derivative is zero and the second derivative is zero. So it slowly introduced this C, you know, the cubic function. So this is the X minus C cube plus. Okay, so that, that function is flat from negative infinity to zero to C, then after that, it becomes cubic function. So if we add this function, then the, it basically satisfies the um, condition for cubic spline. So the cubic spline is to be exact. The Y is equal to the beta naught plus beta one X plus beta two X square plus beta three X cube. This is the most um, left section of the cubic spline, then plus beta four times X minus C one cube plus. So this is for the, so the second most left section and so on. Then up to beta sub K minus uh, K plus three, um, X minus CK. Uh, cube plus. So basically the DC is the model. Most right. So in this way that we can fit the cubic uh, spline. And this is the conceptual, the figures. So this is piecewise cubic function. So I would ask how many parameters for this figure we have only one knot point and piecewise cubic. We have how many parameters we have to estimate? I mean, how many free parameters to be estimated? 
So in this case, we have four parameters here and four parameters here. So eight parameter parameters. And if we assume the piece um, continuity at this C point C, but the each component is cubic, how many parameters are there? Anyone? So maybe, maybe all of you can answer any <laughs> number. Yeah. Victoria? I think seven. Seven? Yes, you're right. So because we have four and four, but the, we have one condition. So four plus four minus one, so seven. Good. And the cubic spline. Cubic spline is the same value, same first order derivative, same second order derivative. How many parameters in total? So if we have, this is F1, F2, conditions are F1C is equal to F2C, F1 derivative C, F2 derivative C are equal, second derivative C, these are equal. So these are conditions. And piecewise cubic, how many parameters are there? Um, yeah, you can answer. <laughs> uh, <Thomas? laughs> Sorry, I cannot hear, yeah. Is it five? Yeah, five, yes. So four plus four minus three, so five. And linear spline, we try. So how many? This is the linear. F, and F is linear, G is linear. Fc is equal to G of C. How many parameters? Anyone else? Uh, maybe. Erica? Is it seven again? Uh, actually, here, the, it's the a piecewise linear. So this is just the beta naught plus beta one x, not cubic function. OK, so then it's just one one additional. So we have the two plus two minus one, so three. Yeah. So how about, how about, okay, so I, I think this is a good exercise and probably we have quiz, quiz on this. So suppose we have three knot points and a cubic spline. Sorry, we have some autocorrect function and that isn't too good. And... Piecewise cubic function, cubic spline with three knots. How many parameters in total? Anyone? Maybe. It's seven. Seven, no, uh, seven, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, four plus one plus one plus one, seven, yes, thank you, yeah. So each component, so, so we have, it sounds like four plus four plus four plus four, but uh, yeah, we have three conditions at each knot point, so seven, yes. And often the cubic spline is used because I, I don't know, but the usually um, probably they prefer the odd degree polynomial, maybe. I don't know. So step function makes sense and piecewise linear makes sense intuitively. And But the piecewise quadratic function isn't used often. I, I don't know the reason, but the, probably it's not really natural. 
um, maybe probably the idea comes from piecewise linear function and piecewise linear function is is increasing or decreasing so um, probably that is one reason that the, they require odd number of um, degree for polynomial so cubic spline is often used so much more um, popular uh, compared to the first degree, second degree, or first degree polynomials. But it's it is of course possible to think about uh, you know the five the fifth degree polynomial um, to fit the spline. But the, usually the cubic spline is the most um, uh, popular one. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I, I was working for a bank the 20 years ago, so, uh, I think for the first time I used the uh, spline and the, um, that is for the yield curve. So the interest rate depends on the maturity of the bond and the maturity. And yield is really have complicated structure like the, um, this and the sometimes higher than this is the yield, higher. Like um, I would say that maybe current yield curve, we say that this is 10 years, five years, 20 years, and 30 years. Then yield curve currently is like, Maybe so yield curve is like this. So the, basically, the yield curve is determined the, uh, for different reasons. For shorter maturity, basically, the yield curve is determined by the 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 um, basically monetary policies and the 10 year and the 30 year it's determined by some you know market conditions because the, there are many bonds traded um, in the market around 10 year maturity and the 30 year maturity and 20 year the trade is rare so we have some you know liquidity risk which makes the uh, yield rate higher so if we want to fit this data probably it's good to have the some knot point here maybe even several knot points here then maybe around 10 years so i don't know around here and maybe around here or something like that so it's reasonable to fit the cubic spline the, to um, observe the smooth um, yield curve anyway so that is just my first um, experience to use the um, spline. So uh, at least the, you know that the splines that are around there uh, for more than 20 years. Yeah, so it is difficult to this, yeah. But the point is that the, um, the most difficult point is how to set up the knot points and also the number of uh, knot points. Yeah, so it's pretty hard if the function is complicated, how to choose knot points and how to choose the number of knot points. So the smoothing spline is more automatic method uh, which solves the, this issue. And the idea is they use the knot points in every interval the between two points. So we have many observations, but the, okay, so if we have, N observations, maybe I would say 100 observations. What is the maximum reason, reasonable number of knot points? And I would say 99 uh, because we have 100 points. Then if we use the knot points in each interval, I think this is flexible enough. So we, fit the cubic line for each section, then that is flexible enough to fit the data. So 99 threshold. So K should be 
smaller um, equal to 99. So the smoothing splines idea is just, okay, so set k is equal to 99. But the, if this you know, graph is too noisy, then we penalize it. So that is the idea. So it's similar to the rich regression or lasso idea. So we minimize. Okay, so we have the just the um, n minus one, not points. Then we penalize the squared residuals. So that is the measure of fit. But plus lambda times the integral. Maybe integral should be you know t minimum to t max. I would say the t minimum to t max. And G double prime the t square. So the you know the second derivative is is a measure of smoothness basically in the um, differential calculus. So then we want to make it as penalty. So the when whenever the G double dot is G double prime is large in absolute value, we want to penalize it. So we take square. Maybe another way is to, to take absolute value, but the uh, take square is probably mathematically most natural quantity. So take square and integrate, and we penalize it. So that is the um, yeah. So that is uh, the way that smoothing spline works. So we don't really have to specify knot points. We don't have to specify the number of knot points. So that is automatically determined. I think that that is the, the just the midpoint between the, the, any two different observations. Maybe two observations have the same x values, then probably the, the number of node points should be reduced. But the, um, yeah, so maybe s slightly smaller than n minus one. But the, suppose that all x is at x values are different, then um, we always have n minus one node points when n observations are observed. Uh, do you have questions so far? Maybe it's still in the middle of 7.5. Um, and okay, so then now um, we consider what's the smoothness of this smoothing spline? What's the degrees of freedom for smoothing spline? So in regression spline, we have degrees of freedom. So if we have, you know, the if k is equal to 10, then we have the um, 3 plus k minus 1, uh, 3 plus k, so the degrees of freedom is k plus 3, right? And the, um, uh, yeah, actually, if we include intercept, that is k plus four. But uh, yeah, so maybe I would say k plus k plus four, right? So zero naught. We have four parameters. Yes. Then smoothing spline is automatically determined by this penalization function. We, we here the lambda should be optimized by cross validation. Um, and to be exact, but the, okay, so lambda is a given constant, then we can calculate the uh, smoothing spline. But the, we want to see the correspondence between regression spline and the smoothing spline. So if regression spline k is equal to 10, then what's the corresponding smoothing spline? So actually, the, we can define this the effective degrees of freedom, effective number of degrees of freedom for smoothing spline. And that is defined in this way. So at first, yeah, so what is the relationship between lambda and diff? So, okay, so yeah, so the, since smoothing spline is the still um, fitting a regression model, right? So the, we are fitting the spline with n minus one not points. So still it's our, um, you know, the estimated y hat is linear combination of y1 to yn. We are almost solving just the linear uh, equations, the, the system of linear equations for this. 
and the um yes uh sorry i think that the um sorry so sorry it's just i one correction one correction i think that this should be k minus k minus four k minus four because the you know the most right section we should have four points right so most right section we have cubic function so we have four degrees of freedom so most left hand left section most most left the section have four observations so actually the number of knots is n minus four but anyway but anyway, so we can solve the linear equation to get y hat. So y hat is linear combination of y1 to yn. Then, okay, so that means our estimate, the y i hat, y1 hat to yn hat is described by just this n by n coefficient matrix times the vector of y1 to yn. And the, here, the S lambda is n by n coefficient matrix. So y1 hat to yn hat is a linear combination of y1 to yn. Then that we define the effective degrees of freedom as the summation of diagonal component of S lambda. So that means, you know, diagonal element is, for example, the y, say y3 hat is equal to, suppose this is, um, I don't know, the beta one, one, um, I don't know, maybe a, a one, one, y one plus a y one, uh, sorry, the a. Oof. A three, one, y one, a three, two, y two, a three, three, y three up to a three p, y p. Then a uh, diagonal element is this. So this is the effect of y3 on y3 hat. So if this number is large, a33 is large, that means we use a lot of information of yi itself to determine the yi hat. A lot of information in y3 to determine y3 hat. So that means the fitted curve is ad hoc. So fitted curve is mostly affected by you know, the um, observed yi. So that means the degrees of freedom should be large. So basically the, we, you know, um, use each yi to explain why I had. So, the, so that is a very flexible model. So that is a very data oriented model. So the degrees of freedom should be large. So maybe most extreme case is the um, all a, a i i so that um so this is here all s lambda i i is equal to one so that is the most ad hoc model and the in this case the degrees of freedom is equal to n yeah and the, if the this s lambda i i is very small values then um model is less flexible and the degrees of freedom should be low and the most extreme case is y i hat is equal to y bar. So we apply the y bar, the, the fitted value is y bar always. So we don't have any degrees of freedom. So basically that is the fitting y is equal to constant model. So in this case, the df should be one. And because the beta naught is only the parameter, but actually the effective degrees of freedom is also one because all, all elements of S lambda is one over n. So average of you know y1 to yn so all of these parameters are one over n so one over n then we take summation over n so that is n so degrees of freedom becomes one so in this way we can define a kind of equivalent degrees of freedom so that is called the effective degrees of freedom for smoothing a spline And optimal lambda is determined by the leave one out cross validation usually, uh, because this is a linear model. So the leave one out cross validation is calculated by uh, just the, this uh, quantity, 
so, which does not require uh, fitting the regression the n times, just the fitting a regression just once, then we can calculate the leave one out cross validation um, error. So optimal lambda minimize this the leave one out cross validation error. Yeah, and here is the um, comparison between smoothing spline and the um, regression spline. So red one is the smoothing uh, regression spline. And here, this is the smoothing spline. So I don't know how regression spline was chosen, but the um, smoothing spline was chosen by the leave one out cross validation. And the effective number of degrees of freedom is 6.8. And uh, it sounds 16 is too large for regression spline. And the, um, yeah, but anyway, so the, these two results are similar. So probably for regression spline, we should choose a smaller number um, for best out, out of sample performance, so test performance. Yeah, OK, so it takes a lot of time, actually. Uh, do you have any questions about smoothing spline and the regression spline? So functions are similar, but the um, smoothing spline has the similar methodology as rich regression and lasso. We have the hyperparameter lambda. Yeah, and the last two sections, the 7.6 is local regression. So local regression is more data oriented method. So it's not really the usual, the regression model, but the um, we focus more around specific values. So it's a kind of similar to KNN. KNN chooses the N nearest neighborhood, a K nearest neighborhood. And the, this idea is similar to that. And suppose that we want to predict Y for given X naught, then local regression, if it's a simple function, typically a straight line, only with a certain proportion of observations, which are closest to X naught. So, maybe s is 0 0.1 then suppose n is 100 of the 100 but the, we use just 10 and s is 10. we just use the 10 closest observation to make a guess on y given x naught so i think yeah next page we have some image So here is an example. So maybe maybe this one is easier to see. So both are the local regression in different samples. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. The, 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 we have to the, discuss algorithm in detail, but the, the, here is the example. Okay. So I think this is the for different s. So this is smaller s and this is larger s. Probably this one, the s is about, oh, sorry. Maybe 50% or 40%. And red ones are closer. Okay, so, and the x not value is here. So we want to make our, prediction at the x is equal to x naught. And the answer is here. And how to get this number? So at first that we pick, okay, so maybe s is, I don't know, 40%. So we select the 40% of closest observation to x naught. So these red ones are closer, closest observation to um, x naught. So these are 40% closest. observations to x naught. Then only using this observation, we fit the straight line. So y is equal to beta naught plus beta one, one x. Then we just pick up 
we think about the section at x is equal to x zero, then that is the you know fitted value. So this is the uh, way the local regression works. Maybe more naive idea is to fit just a constant among this, you know, the 40% of observations. But the, this constant, if we fit this constant, um, this is maybe biased if, you know, majority of closer observations are on the right-hand side of the um, um, X naught. In such a case, probably it's, you know, the biased, right? So it's maybe this is, the case with many observations, but the, suppose that the, we are fitting some model and suppose like the foot size and the uh, height problem. So we think about the um, predicting height by foot size of um, people. And suppose that the, you have the foot size of, okay, so um, 9.0 and the uh, five closest person to you is like the 9.1 and 9.2 and the uh, 9.1 and the 9.0 and the 8.9 or something. And if we take just average height of these five people, uh, since the, these numbers are mostly more than 9.0, it has probably, it will overestimate your height, right? So um, we have to adjust that term and the, this the straight line that makes that adjustment so that is the idea maybe in general we can fit the uh, you know cubic um, maybe quadratic curve or cubic curve within these observations but the um, usually that we fit just a simple um, function such as the straight line yeah maybe the this one i think the uh, s is slightly smaller maybe it looks like the only S is 20% or 30%, uh, but the, you can see that most observations are on the right-hand side of this X naught. So in this case, the fitting straight line is more important. Just the, you know, the if we fit just the flat, you know, average, then probably it will be overestimated. So why, why zero hat is overestimated in this case? Yeah, so that is the local regression and the um, yeah, and the local regression hard part is for each x naught we have to estimate the value. So it's not uh, it does not work like uh, linear regression. Linear regression, if we fit the beta naught and the beta one we estimate this, we can just plug in any X value to get Y hat, right? But the, in this case, for each X naught that we have to fit the regression line. So if we calculate this regression curve, local, this is called local regression. It takes basically infinitely, um, you know, uh, infinite amount of time we require because for each X naught, we have different algorithm. So usually that we fit the value for each observed X value. So that is this. So local regression is fitting for each given X. So we cannot estimate the fitted curve at all possible X since there are infinitely many X's. So usually we only fit calculate Y hat for observed X. So this is the local regression method. And now that we have actually the one more feature in local regression, that is this, you know, distribution part. And the this is another layer of local regression. And actually, you know, um, in this figure, which points are most important? Which observations are most important to predict X, uh, Y, sorry, the Y not hat? What which observations are most important to, to predict this one? And of course that we are given X naught. So the observation close to X naught are more important. So probably that these observations are more important. Maybe these are five more most important observations uh, to fit the regression line. 
right? So we give higher weights for these observations and we give lower weights for like this observation or this observation. This is almost at the border of the 40% closest observations. So it's almost, it's not much different from, for example, this observation or uh, this observation. So those for those observations that we want to give lower weight. So we use the weighted least square um, regression. So we give some weight in regression analysis. So we, we give the more weight, higher weight for observations closer to X naught. So that is another layer of local regression. So the, to be exact, the um, exact algorithm is here. So to fit the um, local regression, to be exact, the, to find the estimate f hat of x naught by uh, local regression. At first, to find the 100 s percent of observations which are closest to x naught. If we have s is uh, 0 0.1, the 10 percent of observation closest to x naught. If we have 500 observations, we choose only 50. Then assign the weight k for each xi. So k of xi x naught is larger when xi is closer to x naught. And actually we can also define this k of xi x naught is as zero if xi is not among k closest observations. And a typical example, typical example of k is the exponential of xi minus x, I'm um, sorry, um, exponential of negative xi minus x0. Square, so we use basically the normal density. So if xi is closer to x not, closer to x not, then um, we have um, larger value of x. Large, larger value of k. If xi is distant from x naught, so this entire quantity is small, so k is small. But still, we have threshold that we exclude the um, um, observations, the except for k closest observations. Then we minimize this, so we have the weight here. So this is called weighted least square. So wait for I observations. Then they're using this beta naught and the beta one that we can predict. So for each X naught, we can estimate F hat of X naught. So this takes time. So this is local regression. Sorry, actually we cannot really finish the all sections and the, um, we leave this 7.7 .7 for the next time. And next time, hopefully that we do some exercise. At first we do a uh, labo session, then after that, that we do exercises. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, and the midterm one is due today and I have already got some submissions and the, yeah, otherwise you can do by uh, midnight today. So do you have any questions about midterm as well? Okay, otherwise the see you on Wednesday.